Photography basics in 10 minutes? Do you want to master the basics of photography in the next 10 minutes? Well, you probably can't because holy smokes, there is a lot to learn. But I'm going to help you get a really, really good head start to mastering all of that. And full disclosure, as hard as I tried, I could not squeeze this one in 10 minutes, so it's going to run a little over. Sorry, not sorry. So grab a cup of coffee, buckle up, and let's go for a ride. Hello, my name is Mike Lloyd. I'm a professional photographer in Silicon Valley, California. I've been shooting for 12 years professionally and teaching for 10 of those. And I have taught, I don't know how many of these photo basics classes, because a lot of people are on the holidays, buy fancy cameras, or they want to go on vacation in the summer and have no idea what to do with the camera. And they just spend all this money. So they want to get their money's worth. Um, and that's where I learned how to teach these concepts was to people who knew nothing about photography. So you are in a good place if you're like, I can turn it on. Uh, and I can shoot on auto, but I don't know what anything does. That's what this is all about. Even if you're like, well, I'm pretty sure I know what some things are, you're going to learn a ton here. And you're going to want to watch this video more than once because I throw a shitload of information at you really, really fast. Am I allowed to say that? Cool. There's nobody else here. So... We're going to dive into this, and I split it up into two parts. The first five points I'm going to go over are all the technical stuff in your camera, and the second five things we're going to go over are things outside of your camera, like composition, leading lines, things like that. So this is a wild ride. You are going to definitely want to watch this more than once, take some notes, and we'll see you on the other side. Photography basics in 10 minutes. Let's go. All right, I lied. I am skipping to number 10, and then we're going to go back to the actual number one. Because if you don't know what the story is you're trying to tell, then you don't know how to set up the camera. You don't know how to set up the image. For example, is the person you're photograph making eye contact with the viewer? Are they looking away? Are they introspective? Are they trying to be seductive? What are they actually doing in the image? How do you want your viewer to feel when they see the image. You gotta think about these things ahead of time because again, if you don't know what you want people to actually feel and experience when they look at the image, you can't know how to set up the image. The exposure triangle. This is absolutely photography 101. These are the three things inside your camera that you will adjust to make a photo brighter or darker. You can raise or lower any of them as much or as little as you want to affect your exposure, which is again, how bright or dark your photo is. There's no best place to start. There's no right or wrong. It depends on the story you're telling, what you're trying to achieve, and what will help you achieve that. But each one of these points has what I call a side effect. It's something else that will happen to your image when you adjust them. So if you want to darken the image by speeding up your shutter, it's not just going to make your image darker, something else will happen. And I'm going to explain that when we dive into each of these three points coming up next. Shutter speed. When the shutter is open longer, more light comes in. And when more light comes in, you get a brighter image. Think of the shutter as a set of curtains over a window. Now, the two components that open and close are actually called curtains, so that's pretty relevant. And the longer they're open, the more light will come into the room. Same thing in your camera. So in this graphic, you can see light is being stopped by the closed shutter. There are two components that make up the shutter, the top and the bottom one, and then the image sensor is on the right in the dark. Then the shutter opens as you take the photo, and the light is now hitting the image sensor. Then the shutter closes again, and no more light is hitting the sensor. That is the end of your exposure. The photo is taken. When the shutter is open longer, we say that is a slower shutter speed. And when it's open for a shorter amount of time, we say that is a fast shutter speed. Now, the curtains don't actually open or close any faster or slower. They have one speed. What we're really talking about here is how quickly they open and reclose again. So if it opens and immediately recloses, we call that a fast shutter speed. And when it opens, there's a little bit of a pause, and then it closes again, we call that a slow shutter speed. And a slow shutter speed 
will show motion. And you're like, what the hell are you talking about? Well, this is that side effect that I mentioned earlier. Your shutter speed controls motion. So a fast shutter speed will freeze motion. So we have this photo here of the motorcycle. No, I did not take this photo on the motorcycle. That would be really dangerous. Thankfully, there's stock photos for that. You can see motion blur, how the road is blurring back past. That's because the bike is moving fast and the shutter is opening and closing slowly. Now this is freezing motion. The motorcycle is still going down the road, but nothing is blurry. It all looks like it's a moment totally frozen in time. This is a fast shutter speed freezing motion. All right, point number two is aperture. The aperture is the size of the opening inside your lens. I'm sure you've seen the graphic before. Here's an example of one down below. And we describe it as F1.2, F8, F16, numbers like that. And what that actually is, is the size of the opening in your lens compared to the focal length of your lens. So it's a formula. F1.2 with a 50 millimeter lens actually means 50, which is the focal length, that's F, divided by 1.2. And that will tell you how wide the opening of the aperture is. So in this case, it 50 divided by 1.2 is 41.67. Now, you're never going to hear a photographer say, cool, let me just open this up to 41.67 millimeters because firstly, most of us don't want to do the math and it's just irrelevant. It's easier to say, I'm just going to open this up to f1.2 and that's how we talk about it. So here's another example. F8 with a 50 millimeter lens is 6.25 millimeters across. So from 40 something down to six, that is a significant difference in the size of the opening of this aperture. So you can see in these two photos, on the left we have F8. Now these are not to scale, uh, but I'm just showing you examples of one that is closed down. And then the one on the right, which is F1.2, is really opened up. That's what's actually happening inside your lens when you set your aperture at these different values. So you can see the one on the right, F1.2, lets more light in. And the one on the left, F8, lets less light in. So the side effect for your aperture setting is a thing called depth of field. And this is basically how much of your image is going to be in focus. So the photo on the left, the landscape photo, was shot in probably F16, maybe higher, where everything is in focus. The foreground and the background are both in focus. We call that a wide depth of field. Whereas the portrait on the right, shot at F1.2, is a shallow depth of field because our subject is in focus, but the rest of the photo is not. ISO. This is essentially how sensitive your image sensor is to light. A high ISO means more light will be recorded, and a low ISO means less light will be recorded. Now, it's not the amount of light that's actually hitting the sensor as we control with the aperture and the shutter speed. It's not a mechanical function. This is within the electronics of the sensor. And because of that, we get the ISO side effect, which is grain. So you can see in this image, there's all the little tiny dots that make up the photo. That is grain in the photography world. And the higher the ISO, the more grain you are going to see. So if you want grainy images, you can shoot with a higher ISO. If you want them less grainy, shoot with a lower ISO. And that is the last of the exposure triangle. Image sensors. So the image sensor is just the piece of technology inside your camera that actually records the image. We don't use film anymore. Instead, it's recorded digitally. And then an image processor takes that data and records it to your memory card as an image. This is like the eyeball of your camera, whereas the brain is like the image processor. The one thing you need to know about sensor is that they come in different sizes, and each of those sizes does something a little bit differently with the mechanics of photography. And there are a ton of different sizes out there, but we're not talking cell phones, we're not talking commercial grade movie cameras, although now those are kind of filmed on, on our DSLRs anyway. The four main image sensor sizes you're going to see are medium format, full frame, which you've probably heard of, and that is the standard 35 millimeter film size, or an APS-C crop sensor, or the micro four thirds that Olympus uses. 
So the larger the image sensor, the higher the image quality will be because they're recording more data. You'll have a higher resolution because you can generally fit more pixels on a larger sensor. They're better in low light because you can fit larger pixels on the sensor, and that's where you get low light performance is the size of the pixel, not the amount of them. And they're also more expensive because it is more technology, more work goes into it, there are more components to it, takes more processing power, everything else has to be beefed up to handle a larger sensor. But the one thing to know about sensor sizes is that it will change the focal length of your lens. So this can kind of be confusing until you go and try it out. But close your eyes and imagine, hopefully you're not driving, that there's a difference between focal length and effective focal length. So... A 100 millimeter lens on a full frame camera, that's like your standard pro level DSLR, will effectively be a 100 millimeter lens. Whereas when you put that 100 millimeter lens on an APS-C sensor, which are, you know, entry level cameras, then you get a thing called a crop factor, which multiplies the focal length by a number. Generally, it's 1.5 to 1.6. So that 100 millimeter lens is now a 150 millimeter lens. And then we get to the micro four thirds sensor that Olympus uses, and it essentially doubles the focal length of your lens. Now you might be thinking, well, that's super cool. I love long zoom lenses. I can take great portraits with that. Well, yeah, that's totally great as long as you have a ton of room. But if you want to shoot portraits and you want to get somebody's full body into the photo and you have to shoot that on a 200 millimeter lens, you're going to be standing like 40, 50 feet back. And if you've got a room that is, you know, 75 feet across, that's great. Go for it. Or if you're outside, fine. But you're also going to be shouting to your subject to give them posing commands. It's just not ideal. Whereas if you want to photograph lions and you don't want to get really close to the lions, then this is perfect. So choose the image sensor size that makes the most sense for what it is you actually want to shoot. All right, now we've gone through the technical stuff. We're going to get into the things you control outside of the camera. And we've already gone over storytelling, so I've got four more to go. The first one is composition. This is everything that is and is not in your image. And a lot of photographers overlook that part because you can add things, add elements to your image to enhance it. And you can also remove distracting elements. Maybe there's a garbage can in the background or a distracting chair across the room that needs to go or a lamp that's on that should just not even be in the frame. Or maybe you want to add things like another prop or more jewelry or a different piece of furniture. It goes both ways, but every single thing that is or is not in the photo should be considered. All right, this is all about posing and it's creating triangles. Again, it's the foundation of posing. This is not a posing video, but I'm gonna give you what I aim for when I am posing my subjects. Regardless of body type or age or whatever, this is what I aim for. Triangles, we are creating triangles because they're flattering. They're aesthetically pleasing to our eye. It's just what our brains want to see when we look at photos. So you can see there are multiple layers of triangles in this image. And once you start looking at images that you find aesthetically pleasing, you'll be able to find triangles in those images. They may not always be the perfect shape of a triangle or a pyramid, but you can connect the flow of the image to make a triangle. Let's look at one more photo. So in this one, you can see two layers of triangles. Her whole body makes one triangle, and then you have the smaller one from her face down to her hip and back to her arm. And if you were to cover part of the image with your hand, so you're only seeing that inner triangle, then that's still a very well composed image. Or if you cover everything using two of your hands and just show the outer triangle, that's a beautiful photo. And then we have the rest of the scene that either adds or subtracts. Let's look at more triangles in this one image. There are smaller ones here. So again, if you use your hands and cover everything but the parts of the image that are highlighted in those triangles, each of those components will still be aesthetically pleasing because we like seeing triangles. Okay, we're gonna make triangles, but do I need to show their whole body every time? Because that first one looked like parts were cut off. How do we know when it's time to cut things off and when we shouldn't? Well, cropping points, they matter. Here are good places to crop. I'll start at the top and work my way down. 
Uh, when I do some really tight headshots, if I'm going for something more artistic, I like cropping through the very top of the forehead, like right at the, the line of the scalp. Um, some people don't like it, but it's an appropriate place to crop if you want to crop there. It's better than cropping directly above the head. Uh, and again, that's in a whole other video. Or you can crop below the clavicle uh, above the bust or the narrowest point of the waist or middle of the thighs or middle of the calves. Here's some bad places to crop. You don't want to crop through somebody's eyeballs because that just looks weird. You don't want to crop through the neck because it'll look like you cut their head off. And you never want to crop through the widest points on somebody's body because of perspective. So that's why we don't crop through the middle of the bust or the widest points of the hips. Also, avoid cropping through joints like the knees or the ankles. Same thing goes with elbows and wrists. Something else to consider, leading lines. Where do you want the viewer's eyes to go? And do they stay in the photo? Now, that might not make sense, but let me show you what I mean. Let's take this beautiful photo of our perceived bride here holding some flowers. What is the first thing you see? Because for me, it's her face. She's making eye contact, and that just draws me right in. But then what happens? Where do your eyes go from there? For me, they go right down to the flowers because of the pop of color, and that's the thing that she's engaging with. And then my eyes continue down her arm to the small of her back, and then right back up to her face. And that triangle keeps looping around and it keeps me in the image. It's comfortable to keep looking at this photo for a long time because your eyes move through the image very easily. Now let's look at this photo. The first thing my eyes see is right down here, this really bright, colorful spot, which I'm not sure why we need to focus on her left hip, but that's how the photo was taken. And then I move up to her face because I want to just affirm that this is actually a person and I want to know who it is that I'm seeing right now since the first thing that we saw wasn't her face. And then just because the angle of her face and the flow of her hair it moves me down into her arm, which brings me down this leg into the bottom and then out of the frame. So this image is not comfortable to continue looking at because the lines take you from an awkward point in the image down to the bottom of the frame. So you're not even looking into the photo anymore. That's what you want to avoid. All right, and our last one, the edge of the frame. This is one of my favorite things to play with. So check out this picture of Jacqueline. Uh, it is a vertical photo, and I've just placed it directly in the middle of this black rectangle. If we place her all the way to the left, she has a ton of open space in front of her. It feels wide open, like there's just this infinite amount of room for her to continue moving through. It feels very comfortable, very spacious. Now we move her to the other side and it feels like she's trapped in a box, like she's up against the wall, she's in a confined space. Even though there's the same amount of negative space in the image, it's all behind her. It's like she's stuck up against this tight spot. So this can be a storytelling element. If you want the subject, or if you want your viewer to feel the discomfort, if you want them to feel the cramped, the, the end of the journey, the, the termination of wherever it is they were heading, you have them face the edge of the frame. And if you want them to feel like this is the beginning of this journey, it's wide open, it's comfortable, there's just space to breathe, then you put them with their back to the edge of the frame facing out into the open space. Well, we made it. I hope you learned something there and your face didn't just melt off in the process because I know I just gave you a ton of amazing information. Again, you're going to want to watch this more than once. And if you figured out how to memorize that all in one go, then call me because I need to learn your secrets. That would be incredible. If you have any questions about the content, post them down below. I would be happy to help however I can. And if you want to get more advanced knowing about lighting and posing and how to make money with your camera, I've got some other incredible videos here on this channel. Or if you're like, Mike, can you just show me how to create multiple six figures of revenue and just like, how do you do what you do? Then, well, yeah, I got you. Head to boudoirguild.com and I show you exactly step-by-step step, everything I do in my own business to generate that kind of income. So you are amazing. We'll see you inside.